So good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Leiner and I'm a professor of radiology at Utrecht University Medical Center. And tonight we'll talk about machine learning in cardiovascular imaging. So these are my disclosures. And before we do a deep dive into where machine learning stands at this time in cardiovascular imaging, I'd like to take a minute and look at the terminology used when we talk about machine learning. So machine learning is a subfield of the field of artificial intelligence. And this is the science of having computers perform tasks that are typically done by humans today. So AI is based on knowledge-based systems and logical systems. And when we talk about machine learning, we refer to a collection of mathematical methods aimed at pattern recognition. So these algorithms try to find structure in data. Now deep learning refers to a specific subfield of machine learning that employs deep or convolutional neural networks. And these networks are loosely modeled on the brain and they learn by example. And these are particularly powerful for image recognition tasks, for instance in radiology, and also classifying based on these images. Now another term you may hear a lot is radiomics, and all of the aforementioned systems can be used to analyze radiomics data. And radiomics data is basically taking the gray scale values of CT images and MR images and trying to detect patterns and statistical uh, occurrences in these data uh, that may tell you something about the presence or absence of disease or other pathology. Okay, so having said this, let's move on to how AI will affect medical imaging. Now, it is my vision, and I think this is supported by literature, that uh, AI will affect the entire imaging pipeline. And this goes from using algorithms to make more efficient indications for imaging, as well as patient scheduling, to acquisition, image reconstruction, improvement of image quality once the images are reconstructed, and then performing tasks like segmentation and quantification without any human input. Now, based on this data, one could generate uh, reports and even classify patients as having certain diseases or uh, having normal images. And machine learning and AI will also be used to uh, predict outcome in patients. And not every, uh, and not all of the information in the images is used for diagnostic purposes, but there's also a lot of prognostic information available in the images. So to summarize, AI can and will be applied to all of these steps. Okay, so in the next part of the presentation, what I want to do is I want to walk you through several examples of research uh, where people have uh, done work in one of these areas. So let's get started with the acquisition and reconstruction papers that are interesting. Now these two papers here by the uh, group from Imperial College in London are great examples of what you can do with machine learning in terms of image reconstruction. And what these authors have done is they created artificial neural networks that were capable of creating CINE MR images out of uh, vastly undersampled data. So what we typically do today is we use things like compressed sensing or parallel imaging to acquire less case baselines and then uh, we reconstruct images out of this. But what these authors did is they let a neural network learn the relationship uh, between undersampled case based data and how images should look like. So they let the network decide the most efficient way of reconstructing the images. And an example of that is shown here. And on the left here, we see a six times accelerated sequence. Uh, by the way, this example is courtesy of Daniel Ruckert from Imperial College. In the middle, we see the convolutional neural net reconstruction. And on the right side, we see the ground truth image, which is the 
not undersampled image uh, that was acquired. So that took six times as long as the images in the left and in the middle. Now this is just one example uh, with a six time six-fold accelerated sequence and uh, this is another example where the authors really pushed their technique and managed to obtain an 11-fold acceleration with still a very good image quality uh, in the reconstruction. So in the middle again you see the convolutional neural network based reconstruction and on the right side you see the um, ground truth which is the 11 times longer uh, duration acquisition that sampled the full case space. So these are really great examples of how machine learning has helped to further accelerate cardiac MR imaging and I'm pretty convinced that we'll see these techniques coming to the clinic in the coming years. Okay, so let's move on. Now let's take a look at segmentation. This is also a task where machine learning has been very successful in the past couple of years. Uh, but before we go into the results uh, that I think are worth mentioning, I also want to show you how you can interpret results when you read papers about uh, machine learning and segmentation tasks. Now some of the metrics that you can use to judge the success or lack of success of automated methods are these things listed in the slide right here. So a uh, very commonly used term is the dice coefficient, uh, which tells you something about how well the automatically generated contours overlap with uh, manually drawn contours, which are typically taken as the standard of reference. Uh, and one indicates a perfect overlap and zero indicates a total absence of overlap. Now another important metric is the mean contour distance, which gives you the mean distance between the segmentation contours. Again, this is the contour drawn by a human expert versus the computer. And when you read papers about this, um, you can see that uh, this is an often reported metric. Now another uh, derivative of this is the Hausdorff distance, which is the maximum distance between two segmentation contours. So when you read these terms, now you know what they mean. Okay, so let's look at some results. And um, one important paper is this one right here. So this is the results of a large group of authors who participated in a challenge called the ACDC challenge. And what this challenge did is they invited investigators to come up with deep learning methods for automated uh, cardiac MR segmentation. Yeah, so segmentation of the left ventricle and the myocardium, etc. So um, a challenge, as you probably know, is basically a competition where a group of researchers makes available a data set with a ground truth uh, in this case, 50 cases with segmentations available. This can then be used to teach a convolutional neural network how to perform this task, uh, segmentation of the left ventricle, right ventricle, and the cavities. And then you apply your developed algorithm to a data set without manually given contours, so you can test the accuracy. So the ground truth is withheld in the validation sample. Now, in this paper that I'm referencing here, the authors compared different algorithms that were used for this task. And uh, what they found was that LV segmentation is basically solved. So uh, nine algorithms uh, of the ones that were submitted were highly accurate for this task with a low bias and small absolute errors. Um, there were some variations in end systolic segmentations, but end diastolic segmentations were basically very comparable between the different algorithms and the accuracy of these nine algorithms was very high. However, it is important to note that the RV segmentation at this point still lags behind. So um, there were just a few algorithms that performed reasonably well. Uh, but as you can see, uh, none of them uh, approach the accuracy of left ventricular segmentation. So this is an area where machine learning hasn't yet solved uh, 
the problem to a satisfactory extent. Now this other paper here that I want to show you is a study that was published in radiology earlier this year and uh, this was results from a multi-center multi-vendor uh, study where a left ventricular segmentation algorithm was applied to data from um, different vendors and different centers and as you can see the LV automated segmentation corresponded very closely to the manual segmentations and the differences were very minor and the accompanying editorial for this study uh, now really uh, is convinced that the time has come for application of these methods in clinical practice. So the editorialist writes that this is a multi-vendor multi-center study and Typically, we spend about 10 minutes doing manual contouring of the left ventricle and the blood pool, uh, but this can now be done in less than one second using uh, machine learning techniques. And I completely agree with this. I think it's ready for clinical practice. All right, so let's continue. Uh, another area where this is going to be very useful is uh, 4D flow analysis. And this slide is courtesy of Dr. Pim van Ooy from the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, who is an expert in the field of 4D flow imaging and analysis. And in this case, what we see here is a 4D flow acquisition of a thoracic aorta with a dilated ascending aorta. And when you want to start calculating advanced parameters like wall shear stress from these data, this takes a lot of post-processing. So, uh, what you need to do is to create masks for all of the slices that you acquire and this is a lot of manual work and takes about 10 to 20 minutes per subject. Now PIM has created an algorithm that does this fully automatically and uh, when we look at the differences between the manual and automated results these look very similar. So that means that this is also uh, possible now for 4D flow data. So as you can see from the Walsh's stress maps here, these color distributions look very similar between the different, um, uh, between the manual and automatic, automatically contoured uh, data. So on the left side, we see a control person. In the middle, we see a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. And on the right side, we see a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve and a repaired coarctation. So when we look at the parameters that come out, um, these compare very closely between the automated methods and the manual method, as you can see from the graphs right here in the bland Altman plots. So the differences were very minor and uh, these differences were probably not clinically relevant. So this is also an area where machine learning is really ready to come into clinical practice. Now another paper that I want to draw your attention to was this one which was just published on October 16 of this year and uh, these authors uh, have published uh, an end-to-end -end pixel wise deep learning method that basically identifies and quantifies uh, cardiovascular structures from coronary computed tomography and geography images. So this is of course a very commonly performed procedure in current medical practice and what these authors did is they tried to develop a tool for automated segmentation to extract the quantitative information that is in these images but we typically don't extract because it takes too much time to do this manually. So let's take a look in a little bit more detail in this study. So this was a study based on 166 coronary CT data sets. Uh, the authors used a modified uh, UNET, which is basically a very simple and bread and butter uh, implementation of deep learning. And they split the data into 132 patients where they uh, created the network with, then they fine tuned it in 30, four patients and they validated it in 17 patients. So they, uh, the output of the network was five different parameters. So a left ventricular and diastolic volume, right ventricular and diastolic volume, 
left atrial volume, right atrial volume, and LV mass. And you can see the results of the segmentations uh, on the right here in the graphic. If we look at the Bland-Altman plots here, um, we can also see that this corresponded very closely with ground truth drawn by humans. And uh, the conclusion also here is that this network is probably ready for clinical application and can help us to routinely um, identify these volumes from coronary CT scans, which is something we don't do today because, again, it takes too much effort to do this manually. Now, here's some work from our lab uh, where we uh, basically try to do the same, but instead of using contrast-enhanced data set, we try to do this uh, using coronary calcium data. So this is uh, coronary CT data acquired without injection of contrast agent to quantify the amount of coronary calcium in the coronary arteries. But it turns out that there are subtle differences in the density of the myocardium and the blood pool that can be used to uh, also calculate volumes from these images, which are basically non-contrast enhanced. So um, this is uh, basically free information that we can extract. And what we did here is we used 18 dual energy coronary CT data sets uh, to derive uh, the method. And then we applied this to 218 non-contrast cardiac CT data sets. And of course, we compared to a ground truth. This was done using a fully convolutional neural network. And we also had the similar uh, outputs uh, compared to the previous uh, paper that I discussed. Uh, but we also looked at ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Now, what you can see here is the results of this paper, uh, where we show that uh, this is a highly accurate method to uh, derive information about the sizes of the uh, cavities in the heart as well as the LV myocardium. So this can be done from non-contrast CT. Okay, let's move on to diagnosis. And I talked a bit about using challenges to uh, compare methodology developed by different authors. And this is one of these challenges uh, that formed the basis of this paper about the left ventricular analysis. So um, uh, this is the automated cardiac diagnosis challenge, the ACDC. And uh, these are some of the results uh, from our lab, uh, but there are many more, of course, many more investigators participated in this uh, challenge. And the idea here was to identify normals versus patients with a dilated cardiomyopathy versus patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or patients who had experienced myocardial infarct or had some right ventricular abnormalities. And as you can see, uh, our convolutional network uh, performed very well for identification of uh, the different uh, disease categories. So basically what we did is we used a convolutional neural network to segment the ventricles and the left ventricular myocardium. And based on the results that came out, we assigned patients automatically to one of these uh, disease categories. Now, of course, we must note here that in real clinical practice, there are many more than just five different disease categories or five different categories to which patients can be assigned. So this is not representative of clinical practice, but it's a proof of concept that you can basically start doing this. Uh, again, this is just based on 100 data sets. Uh, and I think if we would train such a network, let's say with 1,000 or 10,000 data sets, uh, then uh, it would become very interesting uh, and probably um, close to good enough to be applied in clinical practice. Uh, of course, it heavily depends on the practice that you have and the type of, types of patients you see in your own practice, whether or not this would work. The nice thing is this can be done very fast. This just takes four seconds per patient uh, using modern uh, GPU uh, hardware. So these are the results from some other people that participated in the challenge and the best um, group of investigators led by Genet et al. Uh, 
uh, achieved an accuracy of uh, 96%, which is outstanding, and just misclassified two patients, as you can see in the confusion matrix on the right side here. We talked about radiomics in the introduction, and uh, I want to draw your attention to this paper. Uh, this is an excellent paper uh, by Bessler et al. that looked at the capability of radiomics to try to identify scar tissue in the left ventricle, uh, basically just using non-enhanced CINE MR images. So instead of running a dedicated delayed enhancement image where we inject single or double dose of MR contrast agent, we wait 10 or 15 minutes, we then do inversion recovery imaging to try to depict the areas with scar. Uh, what these authors did is they tried to use uh, analysis of grayscale values from CINE images uh, to see if they could detect uh, the presence or absence of scar uh, as well as the size of the scar. So they studied 120 patients um, that had both CINE and LGE available. 72 of those had large infarcts and 48 small infarcts. There were 60 control subjects and the authors used this open source uh, texture analysis package called MOSDA, which calculates 286 features um, uh, of how the grayscale values of the pixels are arranged in the images. This can be done on a standard PC, no need for very advanced hardware. What they did is they took a single end diastolic frame and uh, they tried to uh, classify these uh, frames as having yes or no scar tissue. And if there was scar tissue present, uh, the size was also taken into account. Now these are the results. So uh, for large scars and small scars, uh, uh, the performance of this method was pretty good. Uh, so the area under the curve for the features here varied between uh, basically 80% uh, and 93%, uh, so which is uh, pretty good. It's not perfect, but it certainly shows the power of these techniques. Uh, and I'm a strong believer that in the future this may uh, become a viable alternative to injecting contrast agents uh, and looking for scar tissue. Now this paper that came out slightly more recently um, also tried to achieve the same goal. So using machine learning, or in this case, deep learning, to try to detect the presence of scar tissue. But what these authors did is they looked at wall motion uh, instead of looking at radiomics and grayscale distribution. So this is a complementary technique to the previous paper. And uh, what these authors did is they showed that in 212 patients with subendocardial MIs and transmural MIs versus 87 controls, they were able to pick up these uh, infarcts with a high level of accuracy. So probably when we combine the Bessler method with this method, uh, we could do even better and perhaps uh, could get rid of contrast agent injection for detection of myocardial scarring with MR. All right, let's move on to prognosis. And in prognosis, there have also been published a number of very interesting studies uh, recently. And the first one I want to draw your attention to is this one here. So this slide was given to me by Dr. Declan O'Regan, also from Imperial College in London. And what these authors did is they used machine learning techniques and deep learning techniques to uh, predict survival based on RV motion patterns. And this was done in a group of patients with pulmonary hypertension, which have a notoriously poor prognosis. And it's very hard to identify individual patients purely based on conventional metrics like the right ventricular ejection fraction. So what they did in this study is they used uh, machine learning to automatically segment the right ventricle, as you can see on the left here. And then what they did is they meshed the right ventricular uh, boundary, so to say. And for each of the mesh points, they looked at the excursion over the cardiac cycle. And this is what these are, these loops that you see in the image on the right. Uh, 
So each loop represents the excursion of that particular pixel over the cardiac cycle. And this, there were many more loops that were calculated, but this is just for visualization purposes. So uh, this then served as an input into a network uh, that tried to predict outcome in these patients. So uh, let's move on to this slide right here. Yeah, and this basically, uh, the idea here was that the network learned compressed representations uh, of motion that were predictive of survival. And this was a very powerful approach that improved upon the conventional approach, as we can see in the survival curves on the right, because on the top curve, you can see the survival curves based on the ejection fraction, which is the conventional MR parameter. And um, below this, you can see the machine learning motion analysis prediction. So this is better able to identify patients who do relatively well versus those who have a very poor prognosis. So this is of immediate clinical benefit uh, um, in, in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Now, many people refer to machine learning and deep learning to having a black box nature. And these authors also try to address this problem by basically showing the areas of the right ventricle that contributed most to the poor outcome. So on the left side here, we see a two dimensional projection of latent representations of cardiac motion in the um, 40 survival network, which is the outcome predictor labeled by survival time. So the visualization of RV motion is shown for two patients here with contrasting risks, and the one on the left and the one on the right. On the right side of the slide, uh, we see what's called a saliency map, uh, which shows regional contributions to survival prediction by right ventricular motion. So. Um, this is used to explain which areas of the right ventricle contribute most to the prognosis. All right, so let's move on to this paper right here. This is also very interesting in terms of prognosis. Uh, this just came out in September uh, of 2019. And uh, this is a paper that looked at radiomics to an analyze the, um, let's say the enhancement pattern or density pattern of the fat surrounding the coronary arteries because it turns out that if this fat is inflamed it looks subtly different which can be picked up by computers uh, and then this can be used to uh, look at risk for future myocardial infarction and cardiovascular events. So uh, basically what these authors aim to do is to detect pericoronary fat inflammation with CT. Uh, so this paper actually contained three studies uh, with more than 2,000 patients in total. And what the authors looked at was the attenuation of the pericoronary fat, and they also looked at radiomics of this pericoronary fat. And as output, they looked at adjusted hazard ratios for major adverse cardiovascular events, including coronary revascularization, and they also created survival and ROC curves. And the concept underlying uh, this analysis is basically the following, that uh, in healthy vessels, uh, which are surrounded by, uh, by fat cells, uh, they have a low density on CT. Now, when inflammation starts to arise uh, in conjunction with buildup of coronary plaque, what we see is that there is a, an increase in density of this pericoronary fat. And this increase in density can be detected by looking at fat attenuation and also by uh, looking at the fat radiomic profile, the FRP. Now, if we look at this, so if patients have a low fat radiomic profile versus a high fat radiomic profile, uh, they have a much higher sorry, much lower risk. So when patients have uh, a highly abnormal fat radiomic profile, they have a 10 times to 11 times more chance for a future myocardial event, as you can see on the survival curve on the left. 
Now the important question is, of course, does this add anything over and above looking at conventional features of high-risk plaque? And the answer you can see in the graph on the right, and this is certainly true. So the fat radiomic profile on the right, sorry, the fat radiomic profile uh, definitely adds information over and above uh, conventional high-risk plaque features uh, because you can see this um, in the lower two survival curves. So, uh, so this is independent, uh, an independent predictor of coronary events. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusions. Uh, I think uh, I've walked you through some of the applications of machine learning and deep learning in cardiovascular imaging and what I've shown you is that image acquisition and reconstruction will be affected. We will automate quantitative analysis tasks uh, which will speed up the analysis and allows us to acquire additional information from routine images. Techniques are being developed to automatically diagnose patients, uh, although uh, uh, this is not yet ready for clinical practice, also due to medical legal reasons. Uh, there have been no softwares approved uh, for uh, doing this in, in routine clinical practice. Uh, and I think it's also safe to say that machine learning will have an impact on the prognosis of future cardiovascular events using images we acquire in everyday clinical practice. Now if you want to know more about this or want to go more in depth, uh, we just wrote a review about this uh, in the Journal of Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance, which is freely available, so uh, you can download this by following the link shown on the screen here. If you're interested in machine learning from a broader perspective, uh, perhaps from a societal perspective, uh, these are three great books. So on the left, we have Prediction Machines by Agarwal and co-authors, uh, which looks at the basically the simple economics of artificial intelligence across a diverse range of fields, not only the medical field. If you're interested in explaining uh, how machine learning algorithms come to certain conclusions, the middle book is something that's interesting to read. Uh, this is a book by Judea Pearl that was recently published and tries to uh, use or, or gives you a framework on how you can look at causality and uh, machine learning. Now on the right side, uh, this is a great book by Eric Topol, a visionary in the field of um, machine learning and AI in healthcare. And his primary thesis is that this gives us time to talk to patients again and really address their needs. Okay, so with this I come to my conclusion and I want to thank all the collaborators, uh, especially Ivana Iskum and her team. I want to thank the people from Imperial College for giving me these examples. Uh, I want to thank Pim van Ooy for giving the 40 flow example and I want to thank the funders for funding the research uh, that we presented from our lab. Thank you for your attention.